Hello, welcome to the Wild Line Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is indeed a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Uh, today is going to be a weekend review, and obviously it is a special weekend. Uh, if you listen this week, I did a preview for this weekend, the Star Wars preview. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. It turns out that my guess uh, is looking pretty close here. Um, so what we're going to do for today's show is walk through the top ten, uh, obviously, I'm going to focus mostly on Star Wars: The Last Jedi because it was, um, you know, it's the biggest film since The Force Awakens to ever open, second biggest opening of all time, which I think most of us had guessed was going to happen. Although we didn't, we, um, a lot of people couldn't really pin down where it was going to go, but it ended up doing really well. Um, so we're going to focus on that, but also walk through the rest of the top ten, and I'll focus a little bit on uh, the limited releases since this is Oscar season. Um, but let's get started out here. Let's just start, let's dive right into Star Wars. Okay, so the current estimate, well, let, let's, let's do some context. I'm a big context person. I like telling stories, right? Because, um, you know, even thinking about this sort of analytically, there's a story behind it all, right? And how Star Wars got to this point. Uh, and it can be a little bit long-winded. If you don't enjoy it, you don't have to listen. I mean, this is what I love to do. I do it for free. Uh, I'm a huge nerd with the box office. This is sort of how I like to think about the box office. So I hope you enjoy it. Um... So coming into this weekend, uh, you know, we had an hour-long preview show last week. I covered a lot of this information. Um, But I think overall, the reception to Star Wars Last Jedi in terms of the critics was very high. Um, I think it's sitting at 93% now on Rotten Tomatoes. So coming into this weekend, I think the thought process was, okay, it's going to do pretty well. Nobody really thought that it was going to match The Force Awakens, just because The Force Awakens was probably the most hyped film Uh, in the last 30-ish years. Um, I can't think of anything that even remotely comes close to the amount of hype that was behind J.J. Abrams' The Force Awakens. It was the return of the series, right? Um, And so that did 240-something. What was it, 246, I think? I gotta check. Uh, In the 240s, doesn't matter. Um, When we're talking about Last Jedi and sort of leading up to this, the big context was last year we had Rogue One, uh, which did okay. Didn't do fantastic, opened at the 150 range. Um, that was below, I think, what a lot of people thought, below what I thought it was going to do. Um, and so then we get back to the main canon of Star Wars, and is that going to make a big difference? Well, it turns out it does, right? Rogue One was seen as a sort of offshoot story, a side story, tier B, if you will. Um, kind of reminds me a lot of like the Avengers versus like the origin story movies of Thor and Captain America. They ended up sort of blending into each other by the end there, but in the beginning of MCU... It was kind of like the mainline adventure story, and then you had like the sub single character stories. And Rogue One kind of felt like one of those sub stories. Um, so coming into Last Jedi, you know, episode what are we? Episode seven? I can't remember. Wait, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Episode eight. Okay. Uh, and so episode nine will be in 2019. Um, coming into this weekend, the hype did not seem even remotely close to Force Awakens. People were certainly very excited, um, but it didn't have that fever pitch of, of 2015 when that was opening. I mean, it was just you could f- almost feel it in the air that everybody was going to see Force Awakens. Uh, Last Jedi didn't necessarily have that level of hype, but it was it is Star Wars. It is uh, you know a brand new director, Ryan Johnson. The trailers looked fantastic. Um, the critical response was off the charts. Um, So I think most people thought it would break 200, although um, there seemed to be a a lot of people balking right around Wednesday, Thursday uh, when it was opening. Uh, I think the the most upvoted comment on the subreddit box office, our box office, which I post on constantly, but I don't tell you what my name is. um, It's a really good place to, if you're interested in box office news and just kind of being a nerd about it, just head to the, the box office subreddit on Reddit and you'll have a lot of fun there. Um, but there's an official preview for thread there of what people thought thought it was going to do. And the most upvoted comments were around 197, 200, basically under 200. And so people got that wrong, right? So Star Wars, um, its current estimate as of today and this morning, and this is going to change tomorrow when the actuals come out, is at $220 million dollars. Uh, with a per theater average of fifty-one thousand um, dollars, basically fifty-two thousand dollars, it's right on that edge. Uh, and so it, it, it's weird. It, it, Two twenty meets expectations, right, and kind of goes beyond them a bit. Um, and what's funny about that is going into the weekend, I love how people's perceptions about a film 
color how they think it's going to do at the box office. That's one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by box office uh, numbers and analysis in general is that it's almost less about the films and how they do and more about people and how they respond to different news and different cultural movements. Uh, and I think with Star Wars, and we'll I'll talk about this in a little bit with the Rotten Tomato audience score, there is this weird movement online to sort of attack the film. Um, and it all stems from the sort of alt-right 4chan, 4chan troll world um, the people that help elect Donald Trump, essentially, they were attacking this film. And so I think that some of that negativity bled into pe- how people thought it was going to do at the box office. It ended up not doing poorly at all. It ended up doing really freaking well. Like, 220 uh, is the second biggest opening of all time, right? And I think uh, my guess was 222 uh, in the preview show. And I think I'm probably going to be right on the money because I believe the actuals are going to get bumped up just a bit. Um so a lot of the conventional wisdom among the box office nerds, I think, was wrong. Uh, they thought it was going to go lower than this. And this certainly wasn't everybody, but I think the consensus was it's going to open around 200. Uh, the, the, I think the real question to people was, is it going to beat Avengers? Is it going to beat Jurassic World? And the question is absolutely yes, and it did. But going into the weekend, they didn't think so. Um, and so if you try to, you know, if you put The Last Jedi in context, it's a huge, huge, massive win. Um, it's probably even better than what Disney uh had thought it was going to do i think they would have been happy with the 190 200 but the fact that it's going to go 220 and probably 222 ish 225 ish opening weekend and then next weekend is christmas weekend you know it's christmas eve on sunday this is going to be massive next weekend i don't know how much it's going to drop uh but it ain't going to be a, a big drop at all um And so, uh, you know, essentially just a high level viewpoint of Star Wars is it exceeded expectations. Uh, Tracking was at just about 200 to 220, and it's going to do a smidge above that, obviously. Um, So before I dive into the deeper, you know, details of what happened and who saw it and what the audience was like and what they thought about it, uh, it it just it it should be said that Star Wars The Last Jedi is, is a huge, massive, massive hit. And um, the sky is essentially the limit for this film, just like it was for Force Awakens. Uh, it's going to play super strong all the way for the next two weeks, all the way through New Year's. Um, and then who knows what it's going to do in January. January doesn't really look that packed, to be honest with you. So it could play really well, just like Rogue One and Force Awakens did all the way through February, which I kind of I think is going to happen. Um, and so let's talk about some details here. So obviously, you know, 220 is the current estimate. It's going to go up, I believe. Um, Per theater average, it was just about 52K. And, um, you know, that's essentially what I thought exactly what it was going to do heading into this weekend. Um, Now, if you compare it to Force Awakens, obviously Force Force Awakens at 247, opened at 247, that's opening weekend in December 2015. Uh, Its per theater average was, I have to look it up real quick, uh, 59, almost $60,000 per theater. So there is a significant difference there in their per theater average. And it doesn't sound like much, like 8,000, but multiply that times about 4,200 screens or theaters, I should say. So it ends up being a pretty big difference. Um, In this case, about $25 million difference in its opening weekend. Um, You know, so it didn't do obviously as well as Force Awakens overall, um, but it did do better than Rogue One. Right. Uh, and like we said, it's Rogue One was kind of a maybe not a fair comparison because it's kind of a, a sub story. But Rogue One opened at 155. Uh, its per theater average was a lot lower at thirty seven thousand um, dollars. It ended up doing really well and made over half a billion bucks uh, with a good multiplier. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about like, well, maybe it's important even to consider what happened this weekend, because if you're not a super nerd like me, you probably don't follow, you may not follow Thursday preview numbers. You may not follow the Friday estimates as they come in because this stuff is, is constantly flowing in throughout the weekend. We have a good idea of how a movie's going to do, but at the time the Friday real number comes in at about 11 PM Eastern. Um, and like, you can pick up that information from a lot of different places. So we kind of have to dig for it a bit. Um, so this weekend, the previews basically felt a little, they, they were great. They did, it made $45 million in its preview grosses. Um, it's the second biggest preview number ever, uh, just above Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows part two above Dark Knight Rises, um, but below significantly Star Wars, the force awakens, which did 57 on its preview number. Um, but, uh, so when that number came in probably like 10 AM, uh, Friday, 
people were essentially like, oh, okay. Like, oh, this is, I think the, the consensus that it was going to do just about 200 or probably under uh, was sort of solidified with that preview number because it was so much lower than Force Awakens. Uh, and if you extrapolate it on that number and maybe it follows the same pattern as Force Awakens in terms of its, uh, you know, how much it does on Friday in relation to that Thursday number, it looked like it was going under 200. But by the time Friday night, the actual Friday number came in, which was $105 million, that changed everything. Right. Like all of a sudden people realize that, oh, this isn't as front loaded as The Force Awakens. Um, there's a lot more walk up business. And Deadline had some good data on the walk up business um, of Jedi versus Force Awakens. So 39 percent of the tickets sold this weekend to Jedi were walk up. Uh, they essentially walked up and buy the, bought the ticket the day of um, versus only 24 percent for Force Awakens. Uh, so right there, we already have a significant difference, which makes a ton of sense, right? Some people were saying online that with sequels in general, they tend to be more front loaded. And that is true in general. Um, but when you have a massively hyped film that it was essentially like a 30 year wait for the continuation of the Star Wars story in The Force Awakens, that's sort of a special event. And that's going to be hyper, hyper front loaded because people have been waiting years to see something like that, right? The Last Jedi, we've had two Star Wars films in the last two years, right? Like it wasn't that brand new, oh my God, I have to see it right now, feeling for a lot of people. And so that's why we saw an increase in the walk up business on Last Jedi versus The Force Awakens. And which is uh, another reason why the estimates for the weekend kept on going up and up and up. Because if you just looked at the Thursday number, you're looking at 195 for the weekend. Uh, but when that Friday real day, uh, the, the true Friday came in and how much it did, people were like, oh, yeah, okay, this is this is playing a lot more backloaded than Force Awakens. People are going on Saturday and Sunday to, to see this movie um, in, in a higher percentage than they did with Force Awakens. So um, it ended up having a really strong Friday, Saturday, and the estimate is going to have a really strong Sunday. I think the estimate is even under um underestimating what, what what's what we're going to see on sunday i think the final number is probably going to be in the two mid 220s 225 222 hopefully that was my guess um and so um you know right there you have an indication of, of the legs here right the quality of this movie is so high uh critics loved it um the post track ratings are off the charts good the cinema score was an a um, this, you know, everything indicates that this is going to have great legs all the way through February without a doubt, just because the quality is so high and it has a, a super, super mass appeal here. Now, one thing to know about what people thought about it, right? So the cinema score is a great post tracks scores, which is just another survey that they do. I think believe, they believe it comes from com score. Uh, we're talking 89%, 90%, 94% positive. So really high up there. The one outlier is the Rotten Tomatoes audience score. And people noticed this right away when it got released. On Rotten Tomatoes, the critic score is 93%. Uh, and right now, the audience score is 56%. Okay, so what happened there? Like, every other indicator says that people love this movie. So why is the audience score down that far? Well, it turns out 4chan and probably related groups to that and the alt-right decided to brigade the Rotten Tomato audience score and basically hack it to some degree. I mean, it's not really hacking. There's probably just like brute force, like sending in low reviews over and over again. Um, nothing too sophisticated, but they, they have basically skewed that number down to 56%. Um, so uh, there's a, I mean, that, that's like a, not even a whole show in itself, but like that's a whole nother path that we could talk about. It turns out that the Rotten Tomato score is vulnerable on the audience side of things. So it's best to be pretty skeptical of that you can't hack the com score i mean you can't hack the sorry the cinema score because that's an in-person survey you can't really hack that right uh, you can't hack the uh, rotten tomato audience score and uh, sort of uh, moving forward i think we you know i've talked a lot about the audience uh score in rotten tomatoes and how much i sort of respect it more than cinema score but here in this case i'm totally wrong right the cinema score is infinitely more accurate than this audience score now it is kind of a one-off it did get hacked by a group of people that had an agenda uh, i don't even know what their agenda is i think at the end of the day they're pissed off that a black man and a woman are the lead characters in star wars and not a white dude 
And I think that it's like, dude, this is the 21st century. Get over your fucking self. Like, honestly, if you don't like that, if you don't like black people or women, leave the country. Go somewhere else. Go to fucking Russia. They probably want you over there. Sorry to get political, but I will. Uh, it just pisses me off that people would be upset about something like that. It's just absurd. Um, and they just, the, the, these, these trolls essentially are the worst human beings on earth. They're just totally despicable human beings, if you can even call them that. Um, so they've been fucking with the score a little bit, right? And uh, so we have to completely discount Rotten Tomato score. And moving forward, we have to be super skeptical of it now. Because if Rotten Tomatoes can't figure that out and can't figure out that they're being brigaded by this group of people with so obvious who said they're going to do it, then that, like, that just speaks to Rotten Tomatoes' pretty shitty IT team. Like, come on, guys. Like, this is so obvious what's happening. And, it, like, at, at some point, if you're, like, the Rotten Tomatoes people, you got to be like, okay, Cinema score is an A. The post-track scores are in the 90s. Something doesn't make sense here right and they should have i don't know i don't know what they're doing over there um you know what it oh man this is gonna get like weird like i feel like a, um conspiratorial um rotten tomatoes is owned by warner brothers warner brothers maybe wants to ding disney a little bit so maybe there's a little bit of uh, corporate uh, warfare going on which does happen all the time um but neither here nor there throw out the rotten tomato audience score it's completely worthless um the critical score is what you want to look at 93 percent from all critics uh, top critics for Star Wars Last Jedi with 96%. Um, and the, the critics that I love, uh, that I really trust, that have been doing this for decades and studied film and stuff like that, who are respected sort of academics in addition to film critics, um, they all loved it. And so, in my case, it's objectively good, right? That's how I see it. Um, okay, so uh, audiences really loved it. So that means, uh, you know, it's that's why you got probably a little bit more walk-up score or walk-up audience also, uh, the legs are going to be uh, even stronger because of that. Um, in terms of who went to go see this movie, Deadline had some great... Every once in a while, Deadline just basically copies down Comscore's post-track numbers. And I love that because it's like I have access to it and I don't have to pay for it. Um, post-track is just another survey, right? Um, so who went to go see uh, Star Wars uh, Last Jedi? Let's walk through that real quick. Um, men over 25. So this is broken down into the four quads. Uh, men over and under 25, women own over and under 25. And that's, uh, when we say a four quad movie, that's a movie that plays well with all four of those audiences. Um, so the biggest audience for Last Jedi, uh, not too surprising, was men over 25 years old. They were 42% of the audience. Um, their positive rating was 89%, which is fantastic. Uh, men under 25 were about 25% of the audience, sort of coming in second in terms of the audience share. So definitely... Um, if you look at that total, like, let's see, uh, 67% of the audience was male on the opening weekend, which is a lot higher than I thought it would be. But I think, I think that they're more hyped about it. Like they're more Star Wars fanboys who wanted to see it. I think moving forward, that audience is going to shift more towards the female and maybe get to like a 60, 40, almost 50, 50, uh, um, in the next couple months, uh, men under 25, 25% of the audience, 90% post-track positive score. Uh, females over 25, uh, were just under that 23% of the audience. Um, highest proportion of females was over 25, uh, positive score post-track 94%. So they loved it. Women over the age of 25 absolutely loved this film. Uh, the worst score was actually from females under 25. They were only 10% of the audience. So a little sliver of the audience, uh, only 81% uh, positive score, lowest positive score there from that four group of people. So played best with women over 25, um, but men over 25 were the, the, the biggest audience. And that score isn't that difference, only an 89%, uh, uh, only a 4%, 5% difference on that, on that positive score. Um, okay, so I just threw a lot of shit at you, a lot of data. What the, what the fuck does this all mean? Um, it's a huge win, critical smash hit. Audiences love it. Um Star Wars is top tier popcorn entertainment. That's there's no other way to put it. It's the strongest movie franchise that exists, uh, and maybe it has been for the last 30, 40 years when it when it started. I guess it is forty years ago when it started. I think it opened in 19, 1977. So it's been going for forty years. It is just like it is an American cultural institution. There's no other way to view it. Uh, as much as I, you know, you talk about Marvel and how well they're doing, uh, maybe Marvel will be like this in 30, 40 years, but like star Wars is just, it's like a pillar of like American culture at this point. And, and to some degree world culture, I think it really does 
um, sort of bring everybody together. And like the Disney execs kind of said that this weekend, sort of response to the positive box office numbers, like Star Wars is universal, right? Like it's just everybody is attracted to it for some reason. Uh, and I don't know why that is. You know, it, it sort of has operatic sort of style to it. Um, you can say it's fantasy, it's sci-fi, but I think it's more the story and the characters that really gets people and the grandiosity of the story that they're telling. You know, it's really, truly a space epic, right? And there's something about that that is really attractive to human beings. I don't know why. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not going to go on some, like, crazy uh, sidetrack on that, but, like, maybe it's sort of, like, how we view ourselves in the universe and the fact that... Um, we're kind of on this little rock floating through space. Anything that has to do with space in terms of fantasy and our imagination really uh, speaks to us on some deeper level, maybe some primal level. Like, what is up there in the stars? And, like, here's a story that sort of tells us what's out there. Um, not to get too mythological about it. Um, but obviously some, there's something about these stories and these films and these imaginations and visions of directors about this fantasy world out there that um really speaks to human beings on some some really some level that is so attractive to us that we decide to put spend fifteen dollars now it's every year to go see one of these movies so there is something deep there and i don't know what it is um that's that's more for a phd in uh mythology a dissertation on that um Oh, demographics for Last Jedi, which is also posted on Deadline. If you're interested, uh, 62% of the audience was Caucasian, uh, 15% was Latino, 10% Asian, uh, 9% African American. Kind of a little bit smaller of an African American um, demographic than I think usual for a blockbuster like this. Um, just like demographically speaking, African Americans make up about 13% of the population in the United States uh, and Canada, a little bit less in Canada, obviously. Um, but um, they tend to go to movies, um, African-Americans tend to go to movies a little bit more than the average person in the U.S. and Canada. So you would ho- normally they're going to be a little bit higher than 9%. Um, just to sort of note, maybe that's just an opening weekend sort of um, uh, slant, uh, skew right now for the audience. Um, okay, so uh, Last Jedi, a huge win. Where's it going to go from here? kind of talked about everything I want to talk about, the audience score, the critic score, um, how it played over the weekend. I think it sort of gave a really good background on that 220 score and what happened and why it happened. Um, so where's it going to go from here? Um, you know, I think at least a 3X multiplier, right? Like, I think that would be fair, uh, despite the fact that it has a huge opening weekend, uh, which tends to sort of, in general, would lower a multiplier, but not here. Uh, so you're looking at 660 at least is the basement. I think it's going to go well over uh, over that. I think you're probably looking at a 222 for the actual on the weekends, and I'm thinking maybe a 3.5. You know, it could get to 750, 800, I would say. My gut says that it's probably going to get to 800 because there's going to be a lot of repeat viewing of this, uh, just because the audience scores, uh, the audience reaction was so positive. And Star Wars is like the you know, one of those movies you see multiple times. I saw Force Awakens three times in the theater. I saw Rogue One three times as well. And I don't even consider myself a Star Wars fan. They're just like that grandiose that and such an interesting experience that you kind of want to see it multiple times. Um, okay. So that's Star Wars. We're obviously going to follow it for the next couple of months. Let's keep this train rolling because I don't want to spend the whole time talking about Star Wars. Um, So coming at number two this weekend was Ferdinand. Um, Kind of a bust, to be honest with you. 13.3 million uh, per theater average was 3,700 bucks. Um, Was on a lot of screens, too. Like, that's a low per theater average. Obviously, Star Wars sucked up all the air out of the, the multiplex this weekend. Uh, but you would have hoped that would play a little bit better. Um, it's from Fox, animated film about a bull. Uh, production budget was a um, 111 million. So unless this can pick up a lot of money over the next month or so, it's, this is in big flop territory, real big flop territory. Um, I think audiences liked it. A score and cinema cinema score. Um, critics were kind of. Thought it was okay, 73% Rotten Tomatoes. 
Uh, audience score is 75%, which is not also not really good. Kind of middling scores. Its performance actually is below that middling level. It, it is it, it maybe it's going to it's going to come up here just because Star Wars was so massive this weekend, but I I don't know. I, I don't feel really good about that one doing very well. Um and say what you want about VOD and DVD and stuff like that. $111 million is a lot of money to make up, and that doesn't include marketing, which is probably at least $50 million just domestically alone. Uh, worldwide, you're talking, who knows, $80 million, $90 million? Probably $90, you do $100 uh, just to market this thing. So you're, you're looking at total cost well over $200 million. Bucks. I, I have a hard time seeing this thing uh, making any real money for Fox, to be honest with you. Um, so that was number two. Number three was Coco, another animated film, uh, which has done pretty well this fall winter season. Uh, 10 million bucks. Lost about 500, almost 600 theaters. Um, per theater average is decent. Um, $3,200 on its fourth weekend. And right there, you can sort of see the difference between Ferdinand and Coco. You know, in Coco's fourth weekend, its per theater average is just below Ferdinand's first weekend, opening weekend. So it's like totally different tiers. Um, total so far on Coco is one hundred and fifty buck, uh, one hundred fifty dollars. No, one hundred fifty million dollars. Um, uh, forty five, forty six percent drop. Um, you'll notice the drops this weekend are probably going to be a lot higher than normal, just because uh, Star Wars took up all the theaters and screens. Right? It, when I say it really sucked the air out, it really did. Like, I think everything in the top ten, despite. Uh, outside of the disaster artists lost hundreds of screens, sometimes thousands of screens or theaters, I should say. I always screw that term up. Um, like Thor lost about 1,200 theaters. That's a massive loss in terms of what it's playing on, which obviously reduces its ability to make money, right? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so a lot of the numbers this weekend are going to be depressed because of Star Wars. Um, but Coco had a pretty high drop still, 45%. Even losing 600 theaters, that's uh, pretty high. So um, I've talked a lot about Coco. It doesn't seem like it's playing super, super well uh, in terms of it being an amazing top shelf animation film from Pixar. Kind of its legs seem a little bit underwhelming to me. Uh, but it's going to play a pretty, you know, it's going to play all the way through the New Year's and then some. So maybe it can make up a little bit more on the back end. Um, but it, I guess it's going to end, who knows? Like it's, it's already probably made about eh, 80%, 85% of its total take. Um, so if we do a little algebra here, let's say 85%, because that's kind of the average for a big film like this in its first four weeks, uh, I'll probably end about 176, 180 ish, which is not bad. Um, I thought it was going to go a little bit higher than that into the 200 range. Um, number four this weekend, uh, was wonder, uh, from Lionsgate. This is the little movie that could, as I've tagged it for this, uh, this winter holiday season, a uh, great 36% drop, even though it lost 400, almost 500 theaters, uh, total take was 5.4 million, uh, per theater average is a little bit along the lower side, um, almost $1,800. Um, this is the movie obviously that came out of nowhere. Uh, no one expected to do this well, but it, it had that pattern uh, and I'm thinking back to like Twilight when Twilight first came out. No one, no one outside the people who loved the books and that whole world really knew about it. And like, who made Twilight Summit? Like, it when you first saw Twilight, it was like, is this a lifetime movie? Because it had that sort of low budget feel to it. Uh, but obviously, it opened massive. Uh, and Wonder similar in terms of it had a, a huge book following. Uh, and maybe the profile in Hollywood wasn't that big for the film, but the you know the general population knew about it and wanted to see it, obviously. Uh, so it's over over a hundred million dollars now, one hundred nine million dollars for Wonder. Fantastic performance. Uh, number five this weekend was Justice League, uh, four point one million, Ugh, high drop, fifty seven percent drop. It did lose eight hundred theaters, so obviously that's going to sort of um, uh, sort of be part of that drop, right? Um, per theater average was $1,500. Uh, and it's fifth weekend, not good, not good. Um, takes so far as $219 million. It is just now surpassing what it was supposed to do opening weekend when they decided to green light that film. Um, what else can I say about it? Epic, epic disaster. Heads are rolling as we speak at Warner Brothers. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna get let go before the new year or right after the new year. Um, 
just a an epic disaster uh that honestly has been interesting to follow um you know the, the really big movies like star wars are fun to talk about but sometimes justice league and the, the big flops are almost a little bit more interesting to talk about like what went wrong and i did a whole show about that a couple a few weeks ago so go ahead and listen to that if you want to know more um okay number six was daddy's home 2 just will not go away 3.8 million wonderful 35 percent drop uh lost about 800 theaters too um, per theater average is just below Justice League, and uh, Daddy's Home 2 is on its sixth weekend versus Justice League on its fifth weekend. So it's been playing for an extra week, and its per theater average is essentially even with Justice League. Like, that's nuts. Um, $96 million take so far, almost 97 Um, uh, I think, I gotta maybe say I was wrong about this one, and when they released it, I thought they should have released it right around Christmas. Um, but as these drops keep coming in, it's like it's still hanging around. And to compare that to A Bad Mom's Christmas, and I was curious about this. You know, where is A Bad Mom's Christmas? A Bad Mom, I don't, I don't even see it in the top 35. Uh, a Bad Mom's Christmas opened like what? A week before? Maybe a week and a half? Um, maybe I'm blind. I'm not seeing it anywhere here. I vowed, There's no way it disappeared. Jigsaw still in theaters. Why the hell is Bad Mom's Christmas not there? I guess it's gone. I don't know what happened. Maybe that was part of SDX's distribution deal with the theaters. It's like, oh, you can play it for like six weeks, but we, then we're going to completely pull it. I don't know. That seems... Now, you talk about um, mistakes. It's December 17th. Why is a movie about Christmas still not in the theaters? Like That doesn't make any sense. So it's like, so what I had said about both these movies was this. They opened way too early. I was right about Bad Mom's Christmas, but I might not have been right about Daddy's Home 2. Uh, I think it has a little bit longer legs, maybe a bigger audience poll for Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg. Uh, John Cena at the end there, well, he's kind of in it throughout the movie, but uh, John Lithgow, Mel Gibson, maybe there's just a bigger poll. It was a mistake for Bad Mom's Christmas because it's, we're seven days from christmas eve and bad mom's christmas is not playing in any theaters in the united states or canada huge mistake right way too early but daddy's home two seems to be riding the holiday wave pretty well uh number seven this weekend was thor um 2.9 almost 3 million 52 percent drop uh lost a lot of theaters um basically uh 1150 theaters uh per theater average is 1573 uh, and its seventh weekend, it is now up to $306 million. Uh, huge win for that movie, obviously, doing quite well uh, and having decent legs. Uh, number eight this weekend was The Disaster Artist from A24. Uh, sort of the Oscar bait. Not really Oscar bait, but definitely a lot of Oscar buzz surrounding it. Um, 58, almost 59% drop. Uh, added 170 theaters. It's now over 1,000 theaters. This was sort of a limited release that... Uh, they decided to push wide because it did so well and limited. Or maybe that was the plan all along. I don't know. Um, it's going okay. Uh, per theater average is $2,600. It's made about $13 million so far in its third weekend. But only the really second weekend in, in wide release. Um, that drops a way too high for this to stick around. And this is sort of the thing that I've talked about a lot. Um, um, maybe incessantly, but uh, is... Sorry, my microphone is like going over the place right now. Um, is this this uh, Grand Canyon between uh, art house limited release films and mass appeal blockbuster films or wide releases? You know, like Wonder is a wide release film, uh, but it's not like a blockbuster, right? Like it's any movie with a huge mass appeal that can make a lot of money throughout the country. Uh, and then the other side of that, you have the art house films that do well in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, LA, places like that, but not so well elsewhere in like Houston, Omaha, San Antonio, right? Or St. Louis or something like that. Um, the disaster artist tried to make that leap. Uh, it looks like it's going to fail. And most of the movies that have tried to make the leap this year have failed. Uh, and we'll get to one here in a second, another one. Uh, but the disaster artist is not going to make that leap. It's too much of a niche film. Uh, it's too um, targeted at sort of cosmopolitan urbanites. Um, and so it's just, it's just not going to play in the middle of the country at all or in smaller cities. Um, number nine this weekend was Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, 2.7, almost 2.5 million. 52% uh, drop. Lost a ton of screens. Uh, it's interesting that um, 
Murder on the Orient Express and Daddy's Home 2 open them the same weekend. It's both their sixth weekend now. Um, Murder on the Orient Express uh, has not been playing as well in the long term as Daddy's Home 2. And to sort of illustrate that, uh, Murder lost about 1,200 theaters this weekend. Daddy's Home 2 only about 800. Per theater averages are, 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 are a lot different, too. Uh, Daddy's Home 2 is up to 1,500. Um, Murder on the Orient Express is about 1,250-ish. Uh, ninety-seven million dollar takes so far, but ironically, murder has done better overall. Right? It's so weird when you look at the, these numbers and stuff. It's like, how does that make sense? Uh, Murder's at ninety-seven. Daddy's Home Two is at ninety-six. Um, but the thing is, Daddy's Home Two is having a more gradual glide towards its the- theatrical exit, uh, so it's going to end up doing better in the long run. Um, Murder on Express overall, um, you know, okay performance, not great. They're probably not going to make another one of these. Um, maybe it'll make a lot more money on home video or something like that, but I, I don't know. It just seems kind of like a mediocre performance to me. Uh, they won't be that disappointed with it, but it, cause it kind of was a little bit of, um, I want to say a risk, but it was a little bit of an out there movie. Didn't really match the cultural sort of movements that are going on now, but it said it, it played really well with old people, which I thought it was going to do. And so it did. Okay. Um, one movie I really want to talk about is Lady Bird. Um, I love talking about A24 films. I love that company. I love what they're doing. Um, A24 put out Lady Bird seven weekends ago and limited release. Did really, really well. Uh, had the potential and was crossing over. It felt like it was going to cross over. The hype was off the charts. Everybody was talking about it. I couldn't go a minute without somebody talking to me about Lady Bird and seeing it. Um, had a very good 38% drop. Um, lost about 600 theaters this weekend. Um, so it's expansions over. So it's attempt at sort of crossing that grand Canyon between art house and mass appeal. That's over now. Um, it's starting to slowly, slowly wind down. It's been out for seven weekends. So it's like, you know, it's been out for almost two months now. Um, per theater average was $2,226. Um, which is not bad. I can't really, it's hard to pinpoint how well this movie is doing. Uh, it's at $26 million right now. It's the biggest A24 film ever. Well, that's, I mean, that's not saying much. They do art house films, right? Um, I've, the problem is I don't know how much they spent on marketing, right? And, um, I'm sure it's going to make a profit for A24. There's no doubt in my mind they're going to be profitable. Um, but you know, sometimes people overestimate. Uh, what a movie like Lady Bird does in terms of financials versus something like A Wonder or even like A Daddy's Home 2, right? Like, um, just because people are hyped about it and a lot of people in big cities go to see it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to print money on the back end, right? Like, and I think Lady Bird is one of those, one of those instances where everybody involved is going to be super happy, right? A24 is going to be happy. Um, everybody involved with making the film is going to be happy. It just has done very well. Um, but within the context of being an art film, has it done super well in terms of being just a general movie? Yeah, it's probably done pretty decently, but the overall profit, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be massive. It's not going to be like get out, which was made for $5 million and took in $175 million, um, just the United States and Canada, I should say the domestic market. Um, so it's not big in that way. It's more big in a cultural artistic sense and it will, and has already won a lot of awards. Uh, Lady Bird definitely is going to be nominated for best picture. Um, I don't know if it's going to win anything at the Oscars besides original screenplay. I could see it winning that, but outside of that, I don't know. Um, so that was the top 10, um, outside the top 10, just maybe some more limited movies to talk about pretty briefly. Um, the shape of water. Uh, who is my dark horse to win best picture, even though I haven't seen the film. I just get the, I get, I have this inkling that it, it, it's the right time for Guillermo uh, del Toro um, from Fox searchlight, which is now owned by Disney. I should have, I could do a whole episode on what, you know, Disney owning Fox, but I don't want to talk about it right now. I'm kind of pissed about it. Uh, I think it's going to be terrible for the movie industry, just terrible for entertainment, terrible for consumers. Um, that's my hot take on it. Um, Shape of Water is now in 158 theaters, added about 120 this weekend. Per theater average is 11,000. I honestly don't know if that's good or not. I I don't have a lot of data sets in my head for 158 theaters uh, and per theater averages. I just don't know. It seems good to me. It seems okay. It doesn't seem phenomenal, 
Um, you would want to see an 11,000 per theater average on like 4,000 screens. That would be really good. Um, but it is Fox Searchlight movie. It is kind of an art house movie, although it feels a lot bigger than that. Um, I don't know how this one's going to do. I'm a little bit worried about it now. I thought it was going to cross over and play really well with the ho- holidays. I don't know. Guillermo, man. Guillermo is almost like too much of an artist for, for people. He's too passionate and honestly, maybe even too good of an artist for a lot of people. He, he, I don't love all of his movies, but one thing I can say about every film that he's done is that they're fascinating and they are richly drawn, truly cinematic experiences, right? Like they're just beautiful and so intricate. uh, And he makes them with such love and passion uh, he truly is a, a great artist, and um, unfortunately, over the last few years, you know, I think his, I'm trying to think, his most popular film was probably, I hope it's not Pacific Rim, but it probably did the most money. Culturally speaking, in terms of mass culture, uh, Pan's Labyrinth was probably the one that really got everybody on board with him, uh, It got his name out there, just sort of, you know, all over, all over the world and the country, Um I don't know. He, I, I kind of. I got to take a quick look at him and see what he's been doing recently because I can't remember his entire filmography off the top of my head. Um, I just saw a special with him the other day, and he's God. This guy is just what a fascinating dude, and I'm like gushing over him right now. Um, Crimson Peak was a massive flop. Uh, came out t- 2015. Really interesting film to look at story wise. Blah, whatever. Um, but beautiful film. Pacific Rim. Ugh, hated that movie. Um, I thought I was gushing about it. I'm like ripping on his catalog. <laughs> Hellboy 2 came out in 08. Uh, did okay. Uh, Pants Labyrinth, man. I mean, that was sort of like so good. So, so good. And obviously his early, early work like Kronos and Mimic. Oh, wait. Mimic? He did Mimic? Ugh. Gross. Um, now that I look back, it's kind of an uneven career. I think I like him more as a person and what he, how he talks about cinema than some of his movies. I mean, you can't go wrong with Kronos. I haven't seen The Devil's Backbone, but I know it's really good from what I've heard. Uh, people talking about it. Uh, Hellboy is a huge cult classic. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth, I think, is nearly a masterpiece. Um, and I think Shape of Water, it looks really, really good. That's why I'm uh, kind of disappointed by its per theater average. Uh, after I just said that, I don't know if it's really good or bad. It just doesn't seem great. right? I wanted I wanted this movie to like, make $50, $60, $100 million. I, I don't see it happening now. Um, three billboards outside Ebbing made $1.6 this weekend. Lost a lot of theaters. Just like Lady Bird, um, kind of playing really similar in terms of their expansion. Um, per theater average was seventeen hundred. Uh, total takes so far is what twenty one point three million. This is a prestige film. Didn't make the crossover. Lady Bird like had like got like midway to crossing over to mass appeal, and then I think it's kind of like gliding down now. Uh, Three Billboards is kind of similar. Made it a little bit less far across the Grand Canyon, but sort of is now gliding down. Um, anything else? Darkest Hour added 31 theaters. Per theater average is like 10K. Not amazing. Uh, Gary Oldman's going to get best actor for that. I think we all know that. Call Me By Your Name, another best picture favorite. Um, based on how the critics responded to it, who were just absolutely um, in love with this film. Uh, added 21 theaters. They are really... Sony Picture Classics uh, is doing a really slow rollout for Call Me By Your Name. And I, I kind of respect that because they want it to, they're kind of doing the road show um, strategy. They really want it to be still in theaters and still in people's mind um, by the time Oscars roll out, which is March, right? I don't know when voting is. Um, nominations come out early January, I believe. So maybe like a month, I think. Um, I'm not sure when voting happens. It must happen in like February or something. And the awards are in March. Uh, so I think they want it to play pretty strong in New York, Los Angeles, where a lot of the voters are, Academy voters, through um, that voting session. So they're they're kind of keeping the expansion pretty small. It's only playing on 30 theaters. I mean, come on. I mean, that's like, the, what sucks about that is like a lot of people who want to see that movie, like me, like I, you know, I'm not going to be able to see it anytime soon. Like I can find, I'll, I'll bet you, you know, I'll find it. A screener will leak online on like Go Movies and I'll see it there. And that pisses me off because I would I would like to pay to see that movie. Like, I would like to pay $9 to see that movie, uh, and they won't let me do it, right? So that's fucking bull. That's why the business is kind of fucked up at the end of the day. But in, in any event, um, 
sixteen thousand dollars per theater still in its fourth weekend obviously super small sample size but it's doing okay i just hope they really expand it out a lot more um a lot of limited releases i tanya um only on five screens still um this is from neon brand new distribution company who i'm really excited about they put out ingrid goes west and beach rats uh, they have a really good one coming out next year uh, i forget what it's called um doing okay um thirty five thousand dollars per theater that's strong uh and it's second weekend um what did it do its first weekend because now i'm pretty interested in this one i thought this one also had a chance to do a crossover 66k and it's opening weekend per theater on four screens that's decently high that's high enough for potential breakout um dropped to 35 this week eh, i don't know i, I was hoping it was going to do a lot better than that um Oh, I guess I say I hope it does pretty well. Um, I really can't read that much into a 35K per theater average on five theaters. Like, I just, I don't know. Uh, I don't know when they're going to expand it. I don't know where they're going to expand it to. It seems like it might even play better in places like Oklahoma than, like, bigger cities. Who knows? Um, but it is kind of arty. So uh, that one's still, the jury's still out on Itania and how well it's going to do. Um, oh man, I think that's mostly it. Let's talk really quickly about stuff coming out. I know I've had a long show today, but I don't give a shit. Um, let's take a look at the re release schedule here. It's going to be busy, folks. We are through the end of the year. It is really, really busy. Uh, we have downsizing coming out this weekend on Friday. Uh, this is the, the 22nd. Um, looks really in in interesting film. I uh, you know it's Andrew Payne, uh, Sideways, The Descendants, uh, Election. Uh, did you do Nebraska? I think he did Nebraska. Um, really great filmmaker. He's probably my one of my favorite American directors working today. Uh, Descendants was a really kind of a big hit for him. Uh, surprisingly, it was a very that was a very complicated film. Uh, it didn't seem like it was going to play well uh, with audience, but it, it did do very well. Uh, downsizing looks like it's kind of an appeal for a bigger audience, more of a mass appeal. I don't know how it's going to play. I love Kristen Wiig. Uh, Matt Damon's in it. Um, Christoph Waltz is in it. Um, Jason Sudeikis. Uh, really good cast. The premise seems... Uh, I don't know how to put this. It's certainly absurdist. It's an absurdist um, movie. It's basically like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Uh, but like with uh, obviously a more adult drama sort of vibe to it. Uh, I think it has to do a lot with like maybe like environmental issues. Like people are shrinking themselves to um, hurt the environment less. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that part of it. But I have no idea how it's going to play. Literally no freaking clue. Like none. It could be a huge. I don't think it's going to be a huge smash hit. I think the most it can hope for is a decent performance. My guess says it's going to be more in the flop territory, unfortunately. Just too strange of a premise for a lot of people, um, especially in the holiday season. Uh, Family Figures opens up from Warner Brothers on probably about 3,000 screens. Um, I don't know. This one's been shelved for, I think, 18 months or more. It was supposed to open up last year. Uh, this one could be one of those weird movies that probably never should have come out but may end up being kind of a hit. Uh, Owen Wilson and Ed Helms play the lead. Uh, basically, they're looking for their father uh, with a lot of cool like guest appearances. I don't know. It looks like a stupid comedy. Um, I might. I, I wouldn't go to see it in the theaters, but I might get on, on like HBO or Netflix when it comes out in eight months. Uh, it just doesn't look that funny to me. Uh, I don't think there's a huge mass appeal for it, but you never know. We're in that weird holiday season when people go to see a lot of different things. Uh, also, Pitch Perfect 3 is open up on in about... 3,400 theaters from Universal. Uh, last one did great. Um, I think this is kind of like the last hurrah for this, hopefully for the series. The second one was kind of a kind of a little too much, and the third one looks, looks kind of really stupid. Um, but people go to see them. It's obviously it plays really well with women, and um, I don't know. Like it, it could do could do decent business. I think um, it's kind of a really good holiday winter movie to see because it's just so fun and exuberant kind of the opposite of how we feel during like december and january uh good counter programming oh the post is opening up limited i keep an eye on the post the post could be another dark horse for best picture uh it's about the washington post um, publishing the pentagon papers uh which were a set of leaked documents um from the military not even the military from a military contractor the rand corporation uh, that helped essentially um, helped end the Vietnam War at the end of the day, and like 
made people in America aware that our government lied to us repeatedly and knew that the war was unwinnable since the start, but kept adding, sending more and more Americans to their death, essentially, and killing millions of Vietnamese people for what? You know, so that has, you know, and now the Washington Post is like on the front lines with this, um, I don't know what you'd call it, cultural war, political war against the Trump administration, but it's the perfect time for this movie to come out because the Washington Post has dropped so many political uh, bombshell news stories in the last six months. It's unbelievable. Um, so the timing on that one's really great. I expect to do, it's uh, Spielberg, obviously, and then Tom Hanks is the lead. Meryl Streep is also in it. Uh, should do very, very well, I think. Uh, old people are going to eat that up like catnip. Um, and then that's sort of the end of the, the year. You have The Greatest Showman um, coming out from Fox. Uh, Hugh Jackman uh, about the circus, essentially. Uh, P.T. Barnum, I think, I'm assuming. Um, I could be wrong about that. And then you have Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, closing out the year. Uh, I guess, wait a second. So this is, uh, Box Office Mojo screwed me up. Uh, the Greatest Showman and Jumanji are coming out on Wednesday. This Wednesday. It's like three days. Uh, downsizing, Father Figures, and Pitchfork are coming out Friday. This is like super, super packed. Uh, there's so many movies to see. Uh, wow. A lot of those movies you talked in the top ten, they're getting kicked out of the box office because there's too much new stuff coming out. Um, All the Money in the World's coming out on the 27th. Uh, kind of a New Year's play, I guess. Uh, also coming out on... Um, I guess Christmas it's coming out. This is so confusing. I don't know how to read this at all. I think all the money in the world, Molly's game and phantom thread are all coming out on Christmas day, which is whatever. Who cares? I mean, like Molly's game looks sort of intriguing. It's Aaron Sorkin script. Who's, you know, a fantastic writer of TV and film. Um, it's got Jessica Chastain, who is absolutely a national treasure. She's one of my favorite actresses, really fascinating person too. Um, and then you, so I think it's going to do okay. I don't think it's really going to pop off. Phantom Thread, I don't know what the hell that is about. Like, I was super excited about that film to come out, uh, but it looks so incredibly boring. I'm sure it's like really intricate and beautiful, you know, intricately ro- woven narrative and all this emotional, uh, whatever. It just looks really boring to me. Uh, and I'm an art house person, so that tells you something. All the Money in the World, Kevin Spacey, drama around that with, um, what's the guy's name? Chris Plummer, I think, is the guy who took over. I don't know how it's going to do. 2,000 screens. It's about the Getty family. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out, and a lot of stuff is going to get lost in this mess. And Star Wars is going to dominate through February. That's just the way it's going to be. Uh, then you get into January the 5th. You got Insidious, The Last Key, and I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. Um so overall, um, you know, keep an eye open tomorrow for the Last Jedi actuals to come in. I am hoping it makes two hundred twenty-two million, so I can feel really proud of myself uh, and my guess. I was only about two million off on Force Awakens too, and people thought I was crazy, but I was like, I said like two forty-five-ish, I think. Um, in any event, I will be back um, in the middle of the week, maybe to talk about these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten movies opening this week uh, i might i might just take a little bit of a break for the holidays we'll see we'll see how i feel um and then i definitely will take a break as i'm heading up to wisconsin uh to see the family uh so i don't know i might um maybe i'll do an end of the year special in a couple of weeks or maybe I'll just take a week off we'll see in any event guys thanks for listening to uh the wildland podcast i've been your host dan uh take care and happy holidays <laughs>